All right, thank you. Good evening. The Town of Los Gatos Planning Commission meeting of Wednesday, October 13, 2021 is now called to order. <laughs> Director Paulson, would you please call the roll? Yes, thank you, Chair. Commissioner Suzuki. Here. Commissioner Cavana. Here. Commissioner Hansen. Here. Commissioner Barnett. Here. Vice Chair Birch. Here. And Chair Jano. Here. Thank you. As the Planning Commission conducts this meeting on behalf of the Town Council and residents of Los Gatos, we encourage active participation, which is essential for the democracy and critical to the work of the Planning Commission. Your participation can occur through written comments about agenda items submitted to staff prior to a meeting, which are always welcome and helpful. During our meeting, there are two opportunities for members of the public to participate. During verbal communications, an individual may speak on any topic not on the agenda. <clears throat> and during the hearing on a specific agenda item, any member of the public may speak about that item on the agenda. When called to speak, please state your name and address for the record. And alternatively, you may choose to speak anonymously. It is requested that you limit your comments to three minutes. We've now come to the verbal communications portion of our meeting. At this time, members of the public are invited to address the commission on any issue that is not on the agenda. Director Paulson, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak at this time? Thank you, Chair Janoff. I don't see any hands for members of the public who would like to speak on an item that is not on the agenda. All right, thank you. The next item on our agenda is the consent calendar. The consent item to be acted upon with a single motion tonight is approval of draft minutes of the September 22nd, 2021 Planning Commission meeting. Does any commission member or member of the public wish to pull the item from the consent calendar? I don't see any hands raised. So may I have a motion for approval of the consent calendar? Commissioner Barnett. Yes, I move to approve the consent calendar consisting of the minutes of the last meeting. Thank you, and do I have a second? Vice Chair Birch. Second the motion. Thank you. Any comments or questions? I don't see any hands raised, so we'll call the question. Uh, we'll take a, roll, sorry, take a roll call vote. Commissioner Hansen. Yes. Commissioner Tavana. Yes. Commissioner Barnett. Yes. Commissioner Suzuki. Yes. Vice Chair Birch. Yes. And I vote yes as well, so the motion passes. And Chair Janoff, it looks like Commissioner Thomas has joined us. Um, I am trying to move her over to the panelists without any success. So, Ms. Armour, if you could see if you could move her over, please. I am not having success either. Let me try one more time here. Commissioner Thomas, if you can hear us, if you would uh, log off and then log right back on, see if that takes care of the issue. There we go. Looks like we're able to move. All right, great. So we are all present. Uh, and just in time to move on to the public hearing agenda item number two, which is requesting approval for subdivision of one lot into two lots on property zoned R120 located at 16466 Bonnie Lane, APN 532-02053. Subdivision application M21003. Property owner, Mish Chadwick. Applicant, Tony Jeans. And the project planner is Ryan Safety. Do we have any disclosures tonight? Commissioner Barnett. 
I live within the uh, prescribed uh, uh, radius for proximity to the property and accordingly I'll be recusing myself on this matter. All right, thank you for that. And I will move uh, Commissioner Barnett to the attendee list while we consider this matter. And then when we come back at the end, I'll move him back to panelists. All right, thank you for that. Uh, may I see a show of hands of commissioners who have visited the subject property? All right, thank you. I understand Mr. Safdie will be giving the staff report for this item. Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, planning commissioners. Before you was a request for subdivision of one lot into two lots at 16466 Bonnie Lane, zoned R120. No construction is proposed at this time. The future driveway and building footprint shown on the project plans are conceptual and are not being reviewed with this subdivision application. The future driveway grading and construction work would require an Arkansas site application and environmental review. The subject property is located on the east side of Bonnie Lane and access through a 50 foot wide ingress egress easement dedicated for road purposes connecting to Bonnie Lane. There's an existing 2,704 square foot residence, 518 square foot attached garage and 2,468 square foot detached accessory structure on the property. The applicant proposes to subdivide the roughly two acre lot in half resulting in two roughly one acre lots. The applicant is proposing to keep the existing structures on newly created parcel one while parcel two would be vacant. The conceptual driveway location shown for parcel two would run through the ingress egress easement, but be separate from the existing 20 foot, 20 foot wide shared driveway. The proposed irregularly configured lots comply with the minimum lot size, minimum street frontage, minimum parcel depth, and the existing structures proposed to remain on parcel one would comply with the maximum allowed floor area and setbacks to the proposed new property line. As part of the subdivision application, the applicant proposes a 10,000 square foot private open space easement um, along the riparian corridor along Ross Creek to the rear. The project was previously reviewed by the Conceptual Development Advisory Committee where direction was provided to the applicant. The committee comments and applicant's response letter are included in the staff report packet. Many neighbors have submitted public comments in opposition to the proposed project, which are included in the staff report, addendum report, and desk item report. The applicant's response letters are also included in the staff report packet. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission approve the subdivision application subject to the recommended conditions of approval as the project complies with town code and the subdivision map act. This concludes staff's presentation. Planning staff, Parks and Public Works staff, and the town attorney are available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Safdie. Do any commissioners have questions of Mr. Safdie or staff at this time? Commissioner Hansen. Now I'm on topic. Okay. Um, I do have uh, two questions, if that's okay, Chair. Yes. Um, yes. So the first one is, um, it, it, this is just for the benefit of well, everyone on the commission and also um, a lot of the people that are in opposition. So. Um, we, the findings that we have to make are in exhibit two, um, one way or the other. And the primary one is really the required findings to deny a subdivision application. And so if you consider this as a future development, which it isn't at the moment, then you would be asking questions like the site is physically suitable for the development or for the density. There's, um, there's not any environmental issues and so on and so forth. Um, and so a lot of the comments that are being brought up by the public are around that, which is what we don't have on the table right now. So my question for staff is, um, since those are findings that you would use to deny a subdivision application, um, what do we need to limit our scope to in making the decision um, one way or the other, since we don't have a development application? So the, the project before you, like you mentioned, is the subdivision application. Um, and uh, I believe uh, the town attorney or Mr. Paulson might have more information to add on to that. Sure, so I can add, um, I think as was mentioned in Mr. Safdie's report, you're looking at the subdivision, the findings for a subdivision are included as you referenced 
Commissioner Hansen. Um, any future development of a newly created lot um, would go through whatever discretionary process. So if it's a new house, it's an architecture inside application. Um, and that would have its own environmental review. It may not require a mitigated negative declaration or environmental impact report, um, but that would be determined at the time of application, which would include any other improvements um, that are associated with that. Um, all of those types of environmental factors um, would be taken into account during that process. From a density, as Mr. Safdie also mentioned, um, this meets all of our technical requirements. Uh, density, lot size, setbacks, square footage, um, lot frontage. So from a technical perspective, um, staff does not have any concerns because it meets all of those technical requirements. But future development would have to go through discretionary review if it's a new house for uh, an architecture and site approval application, which obviously is a public hearing, whether that's at the development review committee or planning commission. Each of those determinations, depending on which body it goes to, is appealable to the next higher body. So if a project went forward through DRC, uh, someone could appeal that to the planning commission. If it went to the planning commission, someone could appeal that decision to the town council. Um, so there is future applications that will need to be reviewed, uh, but those are not before you to see. Okay, and so my follow-up question, you answered most of it, um, if not all of it, but I just you know wanted to restate for understanding purposes. So, um, if, if there needs to be an environmental review that, that would come up, it's not necessary at this point in time with this simple subdivision, but there could be the determination made that there needs to be more environmental review as people have noticed with the riparian corridor, that determination would occur more when we get the development application, whether that's needed or not. That's correct. And then, and then what would trigger it coming to the planning Planning Commission, it would be if if it if it was an appeal of a development review committee decision, and or what other factor. So other factors that we look at is compliance with our um, residential design guidelines, um, and or any hillside development standards and guidelines because the lot may be I can't remember if the lot the resulting lot will be over thirty, so some portions of that will be applicable, and so if there are any concerns from a as you've seen in the past, um, neighborhood compatibility uh, concern, um, those typically we forward to the planning commission. You know, if there's a mass and scale, um, it's the largest in the neighborhood, it's the largest FAR, um, and those would generally be looked at in combination. Um, then those are items where we may decide to move that forward to the planning commission. But the development review committee has the ability to approve uh, single family homes in the R120 zone for this site. Um, it just depends on what application comes forward and what technical analysis uh, determines as we go through that process. Okay, thank you. Uh, so before we move on to other commissioner questions, I do have a follow-up regarding the repairing corridor. Um, if staff could please clarify, it's a, I think I recall Mr. Safdie stating that the easement offered by the applicant along the repairing corridor as part of our decision tonight or is, is, is within our decision tonight. My question is, if we have questions about the repairing corridor, if we have questions regarding the, um, the depth of the repairing corridor, I believe they offered 10 feet. Um, we've got other town documents that suggest a, a larger uh, corridor might be required. Um, would we be giving up our ability to evaluate the repairing corridor tonight if we, were to approve this uh, application? I can uh, take a stab at that answer. So uh, no, you would not be giving that up. The, the applicant per direction of the Conceptual Development Advisory Committee uh, offered this as, as a way to you know, help satisfy some of the concerns that there will be lots of construction and development in the future out there. But at the same time, any sort of construction application, if it gets close or within the the top of bank, there are guidelines um, and policies that we follow and it will be reviewed. So follow up to that, assuming the concept, uh, conceptual diagram that uh, the architect has provided is close to where the uh, eventual development would be, it, it doesn't come close to the riparian corridor as, as the primary dwelling on a future uh, lot. 
So my question is, if it doesn't come close to the riparian corridor at that time, we won't have the opportunity to look at the riparian corridor, I don't believe, because it won't be affected by the primary residents. However, future development in the, in the so-called panhandle might be close enough to the riparian corridor that it would be of interest to the planning commission to discuss. And so uh, my concern is that, that we, unless we talk about it tonight, we won't have the opportunity to address that element down the line. And is that correct, staff? Well, I'll just offer a couple of things and then if Mr. Safdie has anything he'd like to add. Um, so again, as Mr. Safdie mentioned, they're not required to provide this dedication, um, or sorry, this easement, not dedication. They're not required to provide this easement. We use guidelines and standards for land use near streams whenever we have development near streams. Uh, most of those are taken from top of bank, but it also depends on the type of structure or type of improvement that's being put in. Um, I think many of you were on the planning commission when we had a project, I believe it was on Highland Terrace, um, where there was a creek. Um, and we talked a lot about you know, slope stability analysis and whether or not a, you know, 15 or 25 or larger foot setback from top of bank was necessary. Um, and so that went through that analysis. So should something be proposed in what you've referred to as the panhandle area or near uh, the repairing corridor, then that evaluation would take place at that time. All right, thank you. Any other questions for staff at this time? Uh, Vice Chair Birch. I just wanted to clarify a couple other items based on letters that we've received from neighbors um, and around where that um, can it influence our decisions tonight or not. Um, I did see a couple letters that addressed the easement. Um, typically easements are not something that we address, um, but I would like you to clarify if there's anything in law as far as the easement that we should be discussing this evening. So as, as noted in actually the, the addendum report exhibit 15, that easement is specifically data, dedicated for roadway purposes and the town doesn't have any information saying otherwise. Um, um, and then if I may, one more quick question. Um, there were also a number of um, comments in the letters about the um, large accessory building, the, which people have called the barn. Um, and I know that there were a number of comments about this actually being a house with a full kitchen, bedrooms, um, et cetera. I, I would like for everybody to hear staff to explain what has happened in the pa uh, recent past year as far as that and correcting those violations. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, so I believe a 2016 building permit did issue um, you know, approval of a remodel of that quote unquote barn structure. It was approved as detached accessory living space. Um, so it, it counts towards the, the main house floor area total. Uh, it, it came about during this process that it, it looks like a kitchen was installed without permits. So a code enforcement case was opened and uh, they were required to remove any cooking facilities um, as well as the, the electrical wiring behind that and uh, that case was resolved and inspected by the building department. Okay, so as far as we know to date then, that is not functioning as a house. There is no kitchen. Um, it is not a second home, as I, I know some people have referenced. That is, that has been corrected and is back to being what we would consider to be kind of a, an accessory structure. That is correct. Okay, all right, thank you. And I would just offer that it does not have approval to be a second house. So that threshold is really the kitchen facilities. Um, so uh, when we received information that they may have installed kitchen facilities, uh, we went out, um, spoke with the property owner, um, issued a citation for correction. Um, that correction was completed with a, an approved building permit. Uh, and that wiring, as Mr. Safi was mentioned, was removed all the way back to the panel. Now, should kitchen facilities be reinstalled um, without permits, um, then you know, we would hope and assume that the neighbors would let us know uh, that that occurred. Uh, but there is also the potential possibility that 
you know, they could request to convert some of that into an accessory dwelling unit, which would allow that to be uh, contain a kitchen. Um, still not a second home, it's an accessory dwelling unit, uh, but those are permitted uh, moving forward. Thank you for the clarification. And just a follow up question. Uh, the <clears throat> a number of the letters indicate that they strongly uh, suggest this is not a barn. Um, could staff please advise how recently that work to remove the kitchen and the wiring back to the panel occurred? Within the last two or three months, though, that was very recent. All right. So the advertisements that we have been made aware of that we some of us have viewed uh, talking about this beautiful home with a full kitchen, uh, would it be staff's opinion that those advertisements are no longer up to date? That is correct. All right, thank you. And I would just chair, I would also add that um, fortunately or unfortunately, we also can't control how um, real estate professionals characterize space. Um, so, you know, whether you call it a barn, a detached accessory structure, um, you know, accessory living quarters, which is an old term that we used to have even back before I started here many moons ago. Um, but that was basically an accessory dwelling unit without a kitchen, um, which is kind of what we have here. Uh, but ultimately, they don't have approval for an accessory dwelling unit or a second home, depending on the terminology. Uh, and if a kitchen is reinstalled, then they will uh, be receiving another correction from our code compliance officer and building will have to go back out there and re-inspect it again. All right, thank you for that. Do any other commissioners have questions for staff? I do have one more, and that is with respect to the many issues uh, raised regarding fire, fire access, uh, fire, um, wildland fire and more fire. Uh, could staff please just summarize what the fire department, the uh, Santa Clara County Fire Department has approved to date regarding the subdivision request. Thank you for the question. Um, and the answer is, is just that the, the fire department, Santa Clara County Fire Department has reviewed the subdivision application um, and they have approved it with no comments. They did not review location of driveway, location of house, um, anything along those lines. And thank you. And then presuming there is an application in the future for development of a house, um, is, it, is it the case that the fire department will take a second look with the development plans in, in front of them? That is correct. It'll go through the same uh, staff technical review process where fire, parks and public works, building and planning all review. All right. Thank you for that. Any other questions? All right, <clears throat> at this time, we will ask, uh, we'll open the public hearing and give the applicant up to five minutes to address the commission. Thank you, Mr. Jeans. You can unmute yourself and you have up to five minutes. Uh, yes, could you please put the, oh, thank you. Um, I'd like to look at this uh, firstly um, <clears throat> in context. This is an irregularly shaped, uh, parcel, but it's also almost two acres in size in the R120 zoning district. So it's way bigger than anything else. The CDC, uh, CDAC asked us if our original proposal was the best way to split the lot. So we did consider alternatives. In fact, one of them, the one in red, um, splits the property into a 20,000 foot lot and a 60,000 foot lot, making the smaller parcel similar to the others on the street but the other became way too gerrymandered and we abandoned it. This was the closest we got to an alternate uh, configuration. Also the potential house site remained the same. So really nothing was gained in doing this. If you could go to the next slide, please. So if we eliminate that, this is what we did um, from the CDAC meeting, we introduced the jog in the um, division between parcel one and parcel two. And we did that to give more room for a potential future house with more privacy from the neighbor to the left who was concerned about privacy. We also clarified the driveway location, which was not clear at the CDAC hearing. 
And I would point out that the little red dot just across the road from um, the access road is a fire hydrant and it is directly across the street, 45 feet from the driveway, making it very available for fire uh, fighting. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, you may have jumped one. Okay, um, all right, let's, uh, let's go with this one. Um, this aerial rendering shows the house, pool and barn, which is the legal accessory structure, which will remain on parcel one. It also shows ample room for a second one acre parcel comprising the 20,000 feet of lawn area at the front with the sports court and parking, plus the additional 20,000 square feet in the panhandle area. There's plenty of room for the addition of one future house between the three homes at the top and the existing house on the property at the bottom. The next one, please. Uh, let's skip that one. Okay, this is a closer view. And what I think I want to point out here, um, you can see the jog uh, in, in the property giving a little more space um, from the original line, which is the dash red line. Uh, for the CDAC uh, saw. Um, we are not proposing any structures on, on this particular uh, property at the time. Um, and the purple line at the top is the 10,000 foot private open space dedication designed to protect the Ross Creek ephemeral stream. This is offered by the owner and it is actually 20 feet wide, not 10 feet, I don't think. Uh, 10 feet would be sufficient to give protection at the creek. So we dedicated or offered 20 feet for dedication. Um, you can see uh, the location of the other structures that we're trying to keep on the, on the right-hand side. Can you go to the last slide, please? So this is where we think the new house would be on Bonnie Lane. Um, its location would really follow the rhythm of the street. Um, the irregular shape of the existing parcel isn't made any worse by this split, rather it brings more conformity to the neighborhood. And I think that the lot split of a two acre parcel to permit this is almost required by the Subdivision Map Act, the general plan and the zoning rules of the town. Um, if you have any questions, I would be, I will try and answer them, but I think I covered everything as quickly as I could. Thank you for that presentation, Mr. Jeans. Do any commissioners have questions for the applicant at this time? I don't see any hands raised. So we'll now move on to public comment. Uh, members of the public may choose to state your name and or your address, or you may speak anonymously, but please understand this meeting is being recorded for public record. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Dr. Paulson, do we have any members of the public who would like to speak at this time? Yes, thank you, Chair Janoff. The first speaker will be Tom. <clears throat> yes, I think I just unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Tom Lippy. I represent Patty and Eric Vanderberg, the owners of the property at 16417 Peacock Lane in Los Gatos. And I've submitted a couple of letters to the Planning Department. And the point I want to talk about today is the uh, street frontage that's required under the town code. The town's code requires 100 feet of street frontage for this interior lot. And the proposed new parcel has only about seven feet of street frontage on Bonnie Lane, uh, which is not enough. Uh, the plans that are dated in July of 2021 show that motor vehicle access will be provided by a new driveway from Bonnie Lane across an unpaved easement area to the new lot. Um, the owner argues that the unpaved easement is a street and that the new lot has more than 100 feet of frontage on the easement. Um, an easement can be a street under the town code if it is a quote, thoroughfare for the motor vehicle travel, which affords the principal means of access, unquote, to the parcel. Um, that's town code 29.10.020. Uh, 
Um, common sense tells you that this unpaved easement area is not a thoroughfare for the motor vehicle travel, which affords the principal means of access. It's somebody's yard and it's not a thoroughfare. Uh, the actual thoroughfare which provides access, vehicle access to this parcel is Bonnie Lane. <clears throat> and the new parcel does not have 100 feet of frontage on Bonnie Lane. Um, the, the appellant, uh, excuse me, the applicant's architect argues uh, at page 149 of your packet that three other properties abut this easement and claim street frontage on it. I don't know what the code said when <clears throat> they were subdivided, those lots. But assuming for the moment that it was the same as it, as it reads now, these properties are connected to Bonnie Lane by a paved driveway in that easement area. So there is at least an argument for those lots that the paved driveway is a thoroughfare for the motor vehicle travel, which affords the principal means of access. But there's no good argument that the unpaved portion of the easement is a thoroughfare. Um, I, one other just housekeeping point, uh, the, when I read the staff report that required findings and the conditions of approval, they don't actually specify which plans are being uh, recommended for approval today. And there's one set of plans from February at pages 36 to 39 of the packet, another set uh, dated July at pages 82 to 86. I assume it's the plans at 82-86, uh, but that needs to be clearly identified in the staff report so that people know what they're commenting on. It needs to be clearly identified in the conditions of approval uh, so that you know what you're enforcing at a later time as a town and so that people know whether compliance, there's actual compliance with the plans that were approved. Um, I think that's my three minutes. Thank you very much. That's time, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lippi. Do any commissioners have questions for the speaker? All right, thank you. Do we have any other members of this uh, public who would like to speak? Director Paulson, do we have any other speakers? We do, one second. Next speaker will be Les. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Uh, yes, my name is Les Kishler. My wife is Susan Kishler. We, I've uh, lived in Los Gatos for 50 years. We bought our home in this neighborhood in 1971. Back in the 1980s, the, this Ross Creek neighborhood was an unincorporated county island. The neighbors at that time agreed to be annexed to this great town. The Planning Commission and Town Council agreed at that time to protect our neighborhood's character, such as low density. The Planning Commission back then showed slides of neighborhoods in the city of Carmel to demonstrate the value of allowing neighborhoods in Los Gatos to keep their unique character and not push all of them towards greater density. Hopefully tonight, the current Planning Commission will continue the previous Planning Commission's history of keeping our neighborhoods safe from higher density. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for your comments. Do any commissioners have questions for the speaker? I don't see any hands raised. Dr. Paulson, do we have any other speakers tonight? We do. The next speaker will be Amir. Hi, good evening. Um, and uh, I want to thank the uh, committee for opening uh, the hearing uh, to the public and to our comments. Uh, I would love to speak uh, anonymously, but I don't think my accent will allow it. So I'm going uh, with my full name. I'm. Uh, the next door uh, neighbor, and um, I just want to, you know, express uh, the hope that this is not some type of a uh, rubber stamp uh, ceremony that we're all participating in uh, today. Uh, I hope the town didn't go through all the effort to put it together without us having uh, at least the opportunity to to have some impact on uh, on the decision. Uh, even though I heard that there is already a recommendation, um, I hope that uh, you know we, we still will be heard. Um, it is important to me to to make it clear that the the objections that uh, you hear today by myself and and the neighbors 
these are not automatic objections. Um, actually, I, I, I would love to, um, uh, to be able to uh, support uh, the proposal. Um, I never objected any of the uh, vast development that happened uh, next door over the past few years. And I um, would really uh, like to support this one, but, but I, I think there are at least a couple of things that really prevent me from doing that. Uh, one, as you hear from the entire neighborhood, basically, not just from me, is the, the, the concern that this um, proposal and development will be detrimental to the quality of life uh, of the neighbors here. Uh, the nature and the character of the street, the, the increased density and everything it would bring. Um, personally, I'm terrified by the monstrosity that will um, uh, be built there. Uh, it's not part of this proposal, but uh, from the little details that, that I was able to gather, um, I heard about 4,000 square feet house, two stories, 25 to 30 feet high um, that is already uphill from, from my lot. Um, it will change our lives um, for the worse. Uh, I think the fact that um, there is a clear separation between the uh, subdivision application and the plans later on, um, this separation is awkward. It, uh, it means that we know where things start. We, do, we have no idea where they end. Uh, I don't think anyone objects the subdivision itself. As far as I'm concerned, the lot can be subdivided a thousand times if it's uh, on the map. What really we're really concerned about is the development it will bring uh, later on. And there is not a word about it um, right now, which means that we are in the dark and we don't know what it means. We have no context uh, for this uh, proposal. So I think that the town basically needs to decide if it wants to um, protect the community and, and be upfront with it uh, or not. Um, and this is the time to That's do time it. Here. I don't think, uh, can I have uh, 30 more seconds? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you may not, but do any commissioners wow. have questions for the speaker? Vice Chair Birch. Um, during the applicants, um, slideshow that they, they were showing us, he demonstrated how they had actually changed the proposed lot lines to move. Uh, again, we can't speak about a house that we don't have an application for, so I'm going to say their proposed buildable location um, in an attempt to move that a bit away from, from your home. Were you given an opportunity to take a look at that um, and, and give any input on how that that buildable, proposed buildable location was being moved, which was impacting where they were moving their lot line. I had a meeting with uh, Mr. Jeans. He mm -hmm. um, uh, detailed uh, what he thinks uh, will be the, um, uh, the, the building location. Uh, what he thinks that the, uh, the plan could be. I absolutely appreciate an effort to uh, accommodate concerns. Don't don't get me wrong, um, but since we are being asked now to object or support subdivision plan that we don't know uh, what its impact is going to be, then I, I think it's very hard for us to do that. And I want to clarify, and it relates to your question. Um, uh, I don't think Mish. Our neighbor, I don't think she did anything wrong. I think from her point of view and from her kind of uh, interests, um, her request for subdivision is a legitimate one. Um, but for me as the next door neighbor and for me as the one that will suffer the, the, uh, the impact of that request, I don't feel I have enough information to know whether I can support it or not. Okay. And once it's approved, my feeling is that it's going to be too late. That's my concern. Understood. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that question. Do we have any other questions for this speaker? I don't see any hands raised. Uh, so thank you. And Director Paulson, do we have any other members of the public wishing to speak at this time? Yes, thank you. The next speaker will be Rebecca. 
Thank you very much. Um, this is Rebecca Guerra. I am the owner of the home at 16500 Bonnie Lane, which is the property on the other side of Miss Chadwick, and also the uh, individual whose property uh, includes the driveway easement of which we've had some discussion. And this is more question than it is comment at this stage, because my understanding is, is that the driveway uh, the shared driveway currently shared by Mission, my neighbor on the other side of me, as well as my own property, are the three uh, properties that have right of easement on that driveway. So I'm trying to understand, and I think your first public speaker also clarified the question a little bit is, what is the difference between a private driveway and easement versus street frontage? Uh, and how is that interpreted in this particular proposal? Um, I wanna make sure I understand that clearly because again, the, the portion of the property on Bonnie Lane is very small. I don't know how many feet, but uh, so if, if um, I don't know if uh, Mr. Schultz or uh, Mr. Paulson should comment on that, but could you clarify that for me and how the definition of private driveway with easement rights for two properties today in the way that it was written up many years ago when it was subdivided uh, versus the definition of street frontage works. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, comment and question. Unfortunately, this is not uh, the time when staff is able to interact with speakers. However, it may be that after the speakers are uh, uh, completed and we hear from the applicant again, there may be additional questions that the Planning Commission will ask of staff. So uh, please stay with us and we'll see if that question does uh, come up. If, if I could just clarify, it seems like your decision is based upon that definition, which is why I'm, I'm wanting to understand it uh, at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Paulson, do we have any other members of the public who wish to speak? We do, next speaker will be Pamela. Hi, uh, I live across the street. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. The committee has been drawn, the commission's been drawn to the creation of subparcel two, but nothing's been spoken about whether subparcel one would be valid. Um, so for example, if this is a road, the shared driveway access, the subparcel one is actually, could be in violation of the Santa Clara County fire standard and cause 16500 and 16510 to be in violation of the standard because the because their driveways would be in excess of 250 feet from the nearest hydrant, which Mr. Dean was kind enough to provide, um, which is at in front of 16503 Bonnie Lane. Um, in order to create a driveway that is that meets the standard for subparcel two, he proposes taking property from 16500. Um, I have not seen anything where the validity of subparcel one has been addressed. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comments, Ms. Key. And do any commissioners have questions for the speaker? I don't see any hands raised. Director Paulson, do we have any other speakers at this time? I don't see any other hands raised, Chair. Let's give it a second. Next speaker will be Eleanor. Eleanor, you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Okay? Can you can you hear me? Okay now. Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, good. Yes, um, I'm on Peacock Lane, and um, I am. We're right across the street from the Ross Creek Riparian Corridor, right there in the Panhandle, which actually is in a flood zone. Unmute yourself? Yes. You couldn't, they, they moved beyond you because okay. you, you weren't unmuted. Okay, well, I says, it says I'm I'm unmuted. Maybe the speaker doesn't work. Maybe. It doesn't work. Yeah, okay. We can hear you just fine. We can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, okay. So can you hear me okay now? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. I guess there was some confusion there. Um, I'm on... Um, 
Peacock Lane, right across from the Bonnie Creek Riparian Corridor, which is in a flood zone. I live across the street. Because of this, insurance costs are basically triple than it was not, okay? We have all this um, unstable environments with droughts followed by floods. Because of the proposed new construction and all the other construction upstream, the potential for flooding is increased. Ross Creek is in the Panhandle and it's just a wide dirt trench with no concrete reinforcement. Because of this, at a minimum, the riparian corridor should be increased to possibly 100 feet or more to reduce the likelihood of flood damage, not only for the area, but downstream from this area. And I don't believe this factor has really been investigated as much as it should be. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Do any commissioners have questions for the speaker? I don't see any hands raised. Director Paulson, do we have any other speakers at this time? I don't see any other hands, but again, let's give it a second. I see no other hands from the public chair. All right, thank you. Um, so at this time, we'll ask the applicant if he would like to readdress the commission and add anything to what has already been said. Mr. Jean, you can unmute yourself and you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, so I want to address the uh, 50 foot wide easement on Rebecca Guerrero's property, which Tom Lippy brought, brought up as well. This is a 50 foot wide dedication made in 1953 explicitly for road purposes and it across the entire 50 feet in width all of that area is singled out uh, this can be confirmed by mike whites if he's available um, he has reviewed copies of the document which was the dedication and also the record of survey that showed that land for road purposes. Um, so the frontage is along the property line of that, not along the road itself. So the fact that there was a 20 foot roadway or thoroughfare supposedly put on it does not determine the frontage. The frontage is the uh, edge of the 50 foot east. I can answer further questions on that if you have it. Um, secondly, um, I'd like to thank Emir, who I think gave a very good commentary. And all I can say is um, I have tried my best to give additional space so that if I get to design a house on parcel two, I have the flexibility to work with him as to the location and um, the design of the house itself. Um, I do this with all neighbors um, when I'm building houses next to them, and I would hope to do the same. Um, I would note that the houses along the street have five to 10 foot side setbacks. Um, we are required to have at least 15 feet, but I'm hoping we can get 20, 20 feet from uh, Emir's property. Um, as to fire, uh, that will be determined um, at ANS application. And there is a, um, a hydrant directly across. Um, I am not sure about uh, fire requirements for Rebecca's property and further up the um, road easement, um, probably because it was done a long while ago. Um, that um, is not currently to code. Uh, and as to the flood zone, this is in flood zone district, flood zone D, which is not in the 100 uh, year flood zone district. So it's uh, classified on the FEMA maps as zone D for flooding purposes. So uh, those were the points that were brought up. Um, I don't think anything came up 
that uh, That's really, time, Chair. thank you. All right, if you have questions, I will answer them. Thank you, Mr. Jeans. I do see uh, Commissioner Hansen's hand raised. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, Mr. Jeans, I, I think I understood what you were talking about with the frontage, but um, so, so I'm looking at Bonnie Lane. And so if I understood because the, the, um, the dedication, the, the, as you said, for the purposes of a road is 50 feet wide, you would add that to the eight feet um, that are the frontage of, of the other lot that you're proposing. So it would be a total, did I get this right? Or I just wanna make sure I was understanding what you're saying. Okay. Um, if you're traveling down Bonnie Lane uh, and reach um, parcel two, on Bonnie Lane itself, there is 7.65 feet of frontage. Um, then there is an easement which obliquely goes up to Rebecca Guerrero's property and two or three other properties up there. The left side of that 50 foot frontage on the plans is shown as 142 feet of frontage on parcel two, an additional 121 feet of frontage on parcel one. So the left side of that 50 foot easement is the street frontage. You can consider it as a road, as a thoroughfare, as a street with uh, sides, with verges, with um, not all solid 50 foot wide of, uh, of concrete as uh, Mr. Lippy was suggesting would be required. The frontage on that property is therefore, uh, actually I think a total of 142 feet. It's 7.65 plus 135 around the corner. Okay, so so what you're saying is we shouldn't look at it from the perspective of um, directly on Bounding Lane. It's because that road takes an angle up from Bounding Lane that there's a, this 140 additional feet of frontage on that street and you're declaring that that's a street because of the nature of the easement agreement. Uh, because of the dedication in 1993, the which required it to be a road uh, to the various houses up there. And that was the requirement for the easement. Okay, all right. Um, so I have one more question here. Um, and it was about the, um, the easement for the open space. So um, is there anything that would delineate, um, that's proposed in the plans that would delineate that that was the easement? Like how would people know um, not to build it? Um, well, it, from my perspective, it is on the tentative map, um, which would, and it's shown on the tentative map as 20 feet wide, along the entire length of both parcel one and parcel two. Um, and it's dedicated as a private open space easement. And that typically, I believe by the town determine, it means I can't build on it. I can't put a fence on it. I can't do anything that is structural on it. Um, the ab absolute details of that, I would have to defer to Joel or Ryan, um, but no, you can't build on it. And you're basically saying, hey, stay away from the creek. Don't put chain link fences on it. Don't go close to the right. creek, leave it natural. Great, okay, good. That, that answers my question. A follow-up question related to the riparian uh, easement. Uh, Mr. Jeans, in, the, in our package on our page 85, where you show the riparian easement, I note that it stops and doesn't continue across the full, what I'll call the rectangular area of the property that butts out from the panhandle toward Peacock. Um, is, is it your intention that it stop there? And if so, why? I'm, I'm assuming that the actual riparian corridor continues across that bump out. It does, but um, I am not sure what any future owner of the property um, might choose to do. If you look at the property immediately to the left, lands of Van der Berg represented by Mr. Lippi, um, 
they are immediately adjacent to that property, um, uh, adjacent to the creek. Um, I felt that the owner made a very good um, offer to dedicate 10,000 feet. Um, but again, in the future, I have no idea what might happen there, but it would be all subject to review and uh, presumably um, environmental considerations. Let's say, for example, a, um, someone wanted to build a bridge there, which was actually Emir's suggestion, um, and have, a, have the uh, second property accessed from Peacock Lane. I'm not proposing that here. I'm proposing that the, it be accessed this way, but I don't want to constrain uh, a future owner ridiculously at this time. All right, thank you for the answer. Uh, and I have a second follow-up question related to the first question Commissioner Hansen raised. And that is with regard to the, uh, the easement. Uh, as I understand what you were saying, and according to the 1953 uh, map or, or deed that uh, was attached in our desk item, is it your opinion that currently there's 163, uh, 263 feet of frontage on this undivided property at this moment? Um, okay, so- Rel me... Relative to the easement in the 1953. Well, document. I'm not looking at the easement. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Um, I think that is uh, one side of it, it appears to be 255 feet long. Um, so uh, yes, I'm not sure of the nature of the question. I think the, um, the actual easement, if I had it in front of me. Um, let, me let me ask, let me ask a, a different way. So currently the property has has the, the full frontage of the parcel as, as we see it as one lot today is the entire length of that easement, notwithstanding the fact that that easement uh, that was uh, granted in the 1953 document isn't completely paved, that, that easement still is in, uh, is in force and available to, to the parcel now or parcel one and two should the subdivision be approved. Absolutely. Um, it, it, it explicitly calls out that piece of land, 50 feet wide by about 255 feet long. The entire property is dedicated for road purposes. All right, thank Not you. Just a little bit of it, but the entire portion. All right. All right, thank you for that clarification. Uh, do any other commissioners have questions for the applicant? All right, I don't see any hands raised. And so now I will close the public hearing on this item and ask if any commissioners have questions of staff, wish to comment on the application or introduce a motion for consideration. Vice Chair Birch. Yeah, based on um, some of the items that came up, I was hoping we could get staff's input or interpretation based on um, I guess the first one would be the idea of this uh, this easement being a street, um, you know, uh, and and the way that we are calculating that to say yes, that is in fact street, that is street front, not a um, I guess not a pass through or I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact definition Mr. Lippy had. So I was hoping perhaps the town attorney or Mr. Paulson might weigh in on how. Um, staff reviewed that to make the determination of it being a street. So I'm happy to happy to weigh in first. Um, so the the issue is that we don't require that every subdivision has <clears throat> all of the improvements done all the way up along their frontage. Um, that requirement to obtain street frontage can be provided through an easement, which is the case here and is the case in other subdivisions that you've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and so we even have it on, you know, actual public right of way where we don't have the dedication yet. And so improvements aren't all the way up to the property line, but those were subdivided. Um, and so it does from the town's perspective meet that 
requirement. And if Mr. Schultz has any additional comments, uh, he'll jump in at this point. Uh, <laughs> it's a very simple. I mean, it's on page 13, and I'm not sure. I mean, it's just a non-issue. I mean, our definition of a street says exactly that. It includes public and private right-of-ways and easements. And we've always, since I've been here eight years, and always this is how we've looked at it. We have, and for the town's sake, we are always trying to create private streets, private easements instead of public roads because of the maintenance and upkeep that we don't have. So you will constantly see more um, you know, private right of ways, private streets, and the argument that this is somehow private and not a thoroughfare and isn't um, improved yet, therefore is not frontage, would would eliminate probably quite a few of these that have happened in the past and will happen in the future. But our definition is very clear. It includes public and private right of ways and easements. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I think the Second had to do with, um, oh yeah, the, the, the question had come up about how the town would address the easement along the creek it, you know, for any future applications and, and enforce that. Could you clarify for us what, you know, Mr. Safdie, if you were reviewing the application, how, how you'd make sure that that was addressed in the future? Yeah, so I'm happy to take a, Take the first stab at it, and Mr. Mr. Weiss and Parks and Public Works can chime in as well. Um, so basically, we approve the subdivision application. That's not the end of the subdivision. They have to go through the mapping process with Parks and Public Works and actually get that recorded. That will then have to show this easement. Um, and Mr. Weiss, I, I believe there's actual language tied to the map, but um, again, please correct me if I'm wrong there. Yeah, Mike Weiss, the civil engineer. Yeah, typically uh, these easements include language to prevent future construction of structures across these areas. So if this subdivision were to be approved with the dedication um, of an open space easement, um, we would require, it would be customary for these easements to be delineated on future development plans. Um, you know, if it were to be uh, delayed enough to where it would be included in a title report, um, it would show up in the title report as well. Um, as an exclusion uh, from the property. Uh, so this would be uh, adequately reviewed and noted on the both the plans and the submitted materials. Okay, okay, perfect, thank you. So just to have a follow-up question uh, before we get to Commissioner Hansen. Um, Mr. Weiss or other members of staff, could you please comment on, I, I'm still puzzled by the notion that the easement simply stops while you still have a riparian corridor that continues across that uh, part, portion of the panhandle that uh, runs into Peacock. Um, what would happen in a future application if someone wanted to create a driveway through there? Well, like Mr. Balson mentioned, we do have guidelines for land use near streams. Um, it does require an offset from top of bank um, it depends on the depth of the stream, um, like Mr. Paulson said, its construction, if it's lined or not. Um, so these are all uh, items that we review. And you know, given the, the current climate, um, constructing a bridge or other structures over a riparian corridor or a stream or an ephemeral stream is something that really isn't uh, typically approved without massive uh, environmental review. Um, so I, I think I would conclude that, that that option wouldn't really be feasible just from an environmental perspective. Um, it, it's not necessarily a, a flood zone issue, it's just a, an environmental concern. Yeah, thank you for that. I guess no, I, just... I, I just wanted to comment that I'm grateful that the, uh, the donation of an easement is, is there, but uh, it, the fact that it stops right when it would most likely be impacted the most is, is a bit of a concern. Uh, sorry, Dr. Paulson. That's okay, thank you. All right, any other questions for staff? Yes, Vice Chair, uh, sorry, Commissioner Hansen had her hand raised and then Vice Chair Birch. Actually, I was gonna ask exactly that question, but but I do want to um, kind of close <laughs> with another follow-up question. So so staff is not concerned that um, that the easement stops because the um, 
development process and our guidelines for building near streams would protect us. Is that correct? Correct. That's the start. That's the start of being correct. Um, additionally, if anyone wanted to do anything near that creek, it would have to go through Army Corps, potentially Regional Water Regional Water Quality Control Board, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and that's where I believe uh, Mr. Rice was getting to the impractical impracticality of the potential of building that. Um, ultimately, they're not required to provide this dedication at all. Um, so, should there be some additional um, interest in providing that, um, that would have been uh, probably a, a good opportunity to check and see if the applicant was willing to do that. I think that question was asked. Um, thankfully, the applicant did not seem to be willing to extend that um, for fear of potentially precluding future um, access from that standpoint. Uh, but ultimately, I won't say what is in my head about bridges, but ultimately, um, any Anything that is proposed, whether it's access or structures in that general vicinity um, where that easement stops um, would have to go through significant uh, development review as well as environmental review, given the potential impacts to that stream and that stream corridor. Okay, um, great. One last question, is that okay, Chair? Yes. So, so, so there was some mention, for example, um, of building a tennis court in the panhandle. So how how does it all work? So the, if, assuming that this is approved with the easement of the 20 feet, are they allowed to build right up to that 20 foot, the edge of the easement, or is there some kind of buffer from the, the easement to anywhere something, is, does my question make sense? So your question does make sense. And yeah. the, the answer is it depends. Um, as Mr. Weiss mentioned, depends on the depth of the creek, the slope stability analysis, um, that can be done uh, in certain instances, meaning that even though the guidelines and standards for land use and stream say you need to be X, you know, some range of 15 to 25 feet, let's use, uh, from the top of bank, if you do a slope stability analysis and that slope stability is found to be adequate, you actually can get closer. Um, so, you know, there's, there's two different components. There's a slope stability analysis, and then there's the potential of uh, impact to any riparian corridor. Um, that riparian corridor conversation would involve a biologist. So um, if we had concerns that we had true riparian corridor out there, we'd be bringing in a biologist um, if they're looking to do anything uh, within that drip lines of those riparian corridors or within that 20 foot buffer. What I will say is, I think it was brought up earlier, um, not only will the easement be delineated on the map, there'll also be an instrument that'll be recorded and referred to on the map that will lay out the legal description of that easement, as well as any uh, preclusions of what can happen in that easement. And so we would be working with Parks and Public Works staff and the town attorney to make sure that's clear. Um, it's our understanding and our intent based on the applicant's offer of that easement um, that we would be looking for language that, as Mr. Jeans mentioned, uh, nothing would be allowed to be built within that 20 feet. Okay, that's that's really good here. I mean, because I, I think one of the stories that was um, brought forward by one of the neighbors about the frogs going away on account of the soccer field is um, something we'd want to avoid. So I, I thank you for that. All right, thank you for your questions. Uh, Vice Chair Birch. I, I think, between you guys, it clarified my questions. So thanks. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I do have one. This is kind of going back to the easement a little and kind of going back to the, the fire. Um, one of the uh, members of public raised a concern about the number of driveways or the proximity to fire hydrant. And uh, could staff please comment again regarding the 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 addition of a driveway and its impact on the existing access to the houses and uh, anything you might like to clarify with respect to uh, that that uh, member of the public, the question that that member of the public had. So, so I'm happy to oh, give that a shot unless Mr. Safty is interested in answering that. Um, feel free, if Mr. Safty, or I'm happy to do it. I was just going to reiterate what was uh, mentioned earlier is that the Santa Clara County Fire Department did review the subdivision application 
They also reviewed the conceptual location of the driveways and the houses, as you see right now. Now, they're not approving them right now with this review, um, but generally when there are major issues like that that are going to impact other parties, they will make that comment. Um, so it's it's my understanding that there there is no impact, but that will be reviewed further once development applications are submitted. And just to clarify, just further, as, as Mr. Sapi mentioned, yes, Santa Clara County Fire has reviewed it. They've looked at conceptual access um, and conceptual potential building placement. Um, they have no conditions of approval, uh, meaning that we don't anticipate any issues moving forward uh, for this property, should it ultimately gain approval, or the other properties um, as a result of any action that's taken here that might be uh, from the approval standpoint. All right, thank you for that clarification. Any other commissioners have questions at this time? Discussion, comment, motion? Commissioner Hansen. I'm gonna comment. Um, so from a, um, from a town uh, policy and guidelines perspective, um, and 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 given the discussion that we had about um, the subdivision map um, requirements and what there is for denial, um, it doesn't seem like there are any red flags without having the development application and knowing that those might be issues. Um, and so, so I think um, I, I do. As I had mentioned in previous hearings, it is a bit problematic when you're kind of looking at this in pieces and you're saying, well, you know, th this piece of it looks okay. And then are we precluding ourselves from being able to um, deal with other issues that come up? But I, I feel pretty satisfied after all the things that staff had um, commented on that, that when the architecture and site applications come in, that we will be able to look at all of the other issues that are concerned. Um, but just as a... Um, not as an approval issue, but I, um, I, I do have a general concern about, you know, where this will go in the future, because when I look at um, what I understand to be the intent, which is that the owner wants to sell parcel one and then build on parcel two, if you look at what's happening in parcel one, it's being built on and built on and built on and built on. And, you know, now we have parcel two, which is more than half of which is in the this panhandle, which has the riparian corridor. And I I, I see that being very problematic going forward, but since we don't have that application in front of us, I can't do anything about that, but I do see that that might be a problem coming up. Um, but other than that, I, I, I feel as though um, that the, app, the proposal meets the requirements of the town. Any other comments? You know, it's, it's true, uh, just to, uh, to add before uh, Vice Chair Birch, it's, it's, it is a little disconcerting to see these in two parts because it's very much the case that what comes next is really the, 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 the key concern to the neighborhood, to, uh, to the property owner, and of course to the planning commission. And so I would just say that um, it would be my hope that the, if this is approved tonight, that the neighbors will continue to look closely at what's coming next. And if there are issues that they see, to be sure that those come before the, they bring them before the planning commission um, so that we can we can help review what might come next. Um, it's, it's a, it'd be much easier if we had the project in hand before we approved the subdivision, it would make more sense, but that's not the way the process works. And so we have this uh, bifurcated process and that's what we have to live with. Uh, Vice Chair Birch. I was going to share some of the same sentiments that it, you know, it is hard when we see these in um, parts, but uh, fortunately it sounds like there are some very involved neighbors that will probably be keeping a very close eye on what may be happening there in the future. So I certainly assume that when any future development comes in front of us, that we'll have a good opportunity to review all the things I think we touched on as concerns today you know, the, the, the creek, the easements, neighbors. Um, so I, I, I'm i sure that we're going to have a good opportunity to, to uh, discuss this further. Um, otherwise, I mean, you know, for as a planning commission, we're, we're pretty limited 
often in a pretty narrow scope of what we review and what we can base our approval or denial on. And if we, we go through the findings that we have in front of us to base this on, you know, I, I assume for myself that we'll be approving this, but I would be interested in what other commissioners think. Muted. You're muted. Sorry, Commissioner Suzuki and then Commissioner Tabana. Pretty much uh, share the same thoughts. Uh, judging by the narrow scope, it's clear that subdividing the property does not impact the evening or the creek. Those are larger issues when development actually does take place. For that reason, I'll approve. Thank you, Commissioner Tabana. Yeah, uh, what I was going to say was um, I agree with a lot of my fellow commissioners. Um, a lot of the issues that were brought um, to us tonight um, were, were going to be issues whether or not they were divided into one parcel or two parcels. Um, so you have to keep that in mind when I was looking at this application. Um, with that said, there are a, a number of findings in Exhibit 2, uh, one of them being particularly that the site is physically suitable for the type of development. Um, looking at the site, I, I, I'm struggling with, with the fact that um, the way the lot line is, is drawn um, kind of meets that requirement. I'm not sure if I can make that finding tonight, um, but I don't know what the what the uh, you know what the thought process was going into that. But if staff can clarify that comment for me, that would be helpful. I'd be happy to jump in and then if Mr. Safty has anything to add. So actually one of their original proposals was to have a straight line, Commissioner Tavana, um, but in an effort to try to move the house further away from the house to the north, um, uh, I don't want to butcher this, I believe it was Amir, uh, his home, uh, which is the one directly to the north, which would be most impacted. They put a jog so that that house could be moved further away. Um, you know, right now, this zoning designation um, has a 15-foot requirement. Most of those homes, I believe was mentioned in the public testimony, um, actually have about five-foot side setbacks. So this one will be more than three times that. And so that was the reason for that jog. Um, you know, I know there was a lot of comments as well relating to density. Um, frankly, these both of these lots, even after subdivision, will be half the density of the other lots on body land. Um, because those spots are approximately half an acre um, on the larger ones, and they have a house, and these are both going to be uh, twice that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I just wanted to comment, too, that um, whether or not the, the, the site is physically suitable for this type of development, I think the type of development that we're being asked to consider is uh, a dwelling. We don't know the specific configuration of it. We don't know the size of it or the specific placement. But certainly, even if we're only looking at the front part of the lot, which is approximately 20,000 square feet, it's a sizable, uh, it's a sizable lot uh, that, that almost certainly could support some sort of a, a house being developed. Um, Commissioner Hansen. Um, I was going to comment exactly to that is, is that, you know, when I asked my questions at the beginning, it might not have been clear why, but um, it, it's because of this bifurcated process where we have um, the subdivision application and then later the architecture and site. So my understanding is the guidance that we've gotten from staff is that that we can't we can't make a finding to deny based on whether it's suitable for the type of development because we don't have a development application in front of us. So um, so for that reason, you know, I, we can't we we wouldn't make any finding to deny the application since we don't have the details of what that development would be. And if that's not correct, then I would hope staff will correct me. Well, I think both you and Chair Janoff are both correct. And Chair Janoff, you're on mute. So sorry for talking over you. I didn't know until Thank I saw you your ahead. mouth moving. <laughs> uh, um, but yes, I mean, again, it gets back to the single family home and whether it's the footprint of the single family home that they illustrate, they technically don't have to illustrate that. Frankly, we ask them to illustrate those things to show that yes, there can be a house there. Um, it is possible because I know that's come up in the past. It's 99.9% .9 of the time with a subdivision application, you are not gonna see the home. 
Um, you know, that's just the nature of, of the subdivision. And so ultimately, you know, those, the, the applicants are coming in and they're either not sure what they want to do with it um, or they're planning to sell it. And so that would be up to whoever bought it to do that development. And then it would go through our process and uh, go through that process, whatever, whether that's again, DRC or planning commission, uh, but we do have processes set up for that. So uh, I think that's why staff felt we couldn't make that finding, for instance, is that it's clearly suitable for a single family home, whether it's that footprint or not, that will be determined as we move forward, should an architecture and site application come forward. All right, thank you for that. Now, Commissioner Thomas. Oh, I was just going to add that I also had a question about the type of development because it's like not specific and we can't take that into consideration, but um, from the discussion tonight, I now am comfortable with understanding and taking everything into account that it is the site is suitable for a type of development that could be proposed. It's not creating a lot that there's no development or any development would go against our general plan or town code. So along with that, if a dwelling can be built there, I'm comfortable making that finding now at the end of our discussion and the rest of the findings also. All right, thank you, Commissioner Hansen. So I'm um, prepared to make a motion if there's no additional comments. Please go ahead. Okay, so I move to approve subdivision application M-21-003, requesting approval for subdivision of one lot into two lots on property zoned R120, APN 532 2 02-053, I hope I got the numbers right, uh, property owner, Ms. Chadwick, applicant, Tony Jeans, and project planner, Ryan Safty. I can make the findings um, that um, it's um, category, categorically not subject to CEQA at this point in time. And I can also make the, um, none of the findings that would deny a subdivision application as are listed in exhibit two, um, given that we only have the subdivision application on the table. And I, I would also include the condition of approval that was listed um, to include the, um, the open space easement um, near the riparian corridor. All right, thank you. Do we have a second by Chair Birch? I'll second the motion. Thank you. Any further discussion? Chair, before we call the question, I just want to illustrate that um, it's pursuant to the conditions of approval on attachment or sorry, page nine of the staff report uh, and the development plans that are also referenced in the staff report, which I believe are exhibit three for the conditions of approval and exhibit 10 for the development plans. Is that accurate, Mr. Safty? That is correct. All right, thank you for that clarification. Do we need to amend the motion or loop back on that? No, okay. We All do right. not. All right, great. I don't see any hands raised, so I will call the question. Commissioner Suzuki. Yes. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Tavana. Yes. Commissioner Hansen. Yes. Vice Chair Birch. Yes. And I vote yes as well, so the motion passes unanimously. Are there appeal rights on this motion, Director Paulson? There are, thank you, Chair. Anyone who's not satisfied with the decision can appeal the decision to the Town Council. Forms are available online. Um, there is a fee for filing the appeal and the appeal must be filed within 10 days. All right, so at this time, we'll move on to other business, starting with the report from the Director of Community Development, Dr. Paulson. Thank you, just a couple of brief things. Um, we had a, an additional community meeting last week on Wednesday for the general plan, um, was very well attended. Uh, it was great to hear uh, from folks and we continue to hear from folks. And so we're, we're working with our consultants to figure out next steps for um, completing the final EIR um, and getting those response to comments done. The other thing I would just plug is that the uh, recruitment is currently on for the adult commissions and committees. And so that deadline I believe is December 3rd. Um, so if you are interested in either re-upping uh, for your current assignments or you have 
friends or family who might be interested in uh, some of the available openings, definitely encourage them to apply. That information is available on the town's website uh, at the clerk's website. Thank you. All right, thank you for that report. And finally, we have subcommittee reports. In addition to service on the Planning Commission, members of the commission serve on several town committees. Do we have any reports tonight? Oh, I'm we, sorry. We will have at least we will have at least one. I need to. Yes. Oh, here we go. He's coming back over now. Yep. Here we go. Um, the CDAC met, um, met today to discuss the request for a proposal uh, for a preliminary review, review of an amendment to the North 40 specific plan. And that concerns the construction of a two story uh, commercial building, including a first level mini mart at 15171 Los Gatos Boulevard, which is at the southwest corner of Lark Avenue and Los Gatos Boulevard. And the preliminary uh, review includes the removal of the existing mini mart and service bays. And the CDAC considered comments from the owner and offered perspectives concerning the proposal. All right, thank you for that report. Do we have any other reports tonight? I don't think we've had any other subcommittee meetings. No. All right, thank you all for participating in this meeting. This was a, a great discussion about a difficult issue and I appreciate all the comments and thoughtful uh, consideration. This meeting is uh, now adjourned.